Good evening and welcome to the Mountain Science and Energy Museum lecture series held here at the, the new Cold War Development Center. Uh, we thank you for coming on this very wet night, but uh, I think uh, you, you will enjoy what you're going to hear. This evening we get to uh, welcome back uh, Dr. David Schmidt, who has talked to us about geology and other interesting historical things here in the Dayton area, and we'll add to that list of information by talking about railway transportation and the rise of the south suburbs. Believe it or not, we had an active uh, um, com commuting system here in the past. It will be interesting to hear about it. So, so Dr. Schmidt is a, is a um, professor at Wright State University in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. And uh, he has his um, BS and MS from Wright State and a PhD from uh, Ohio State University. So he uh, comes well equipped to tell us about the history of South Dayton early on. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me as your guest again. Uh, wonderful to be here and to be so warmly welcomed. Uh, and it's great to see how the facility is taking shape here. This is, this is great. Uh, tonight, uh, again, I'll be discussing railway transportation and the rise of the south suburbs. I uh, am uh, my day job is at Wright State University, but I'm also a consulting member of the Oakwood Historical Society as an outlet for some of my historical interests. So my objective for tonight is to describe the steam and the electric passenger railways that serve the South Dayton area. Uh, give you a little bit of background on those and show my primary focus is to show how they influence the development of the suburban plats to the south of town. And this is a little kind of Kettering and Oakwood centric. Uh, Bob asked me to throw in a few things about the area a little more south of there and so I've tried to pepper in what I can about that but that's that's going a little bit out of my board so uh, uh, I uh, hope to keep that in mind if, if you have questions about that. But what I'd like to focus on, for the most part, is how these railways influenced some of the earliest suburbs to the south of the city, specifically uh, Oakwood, portions of the Kettering area around Beavertown, and also the old Carmont or Southern Hills neighborhood to the, uh, to the, uh, to the west. Would it be helpful to bring the lights down up front? Can we, can we do that? Um, I think we're having a little... And while they're doing that, would you, uh, for reference to us who are not familiar with that, where roughly are we on this map? Does Miamisburg appear? Uh, so here's Alexandersville and West Carrollton, and so we're down in this area okay. somewhere. So I've, I've cut us off here a little bit. Right. Thank Thanks. Uh, so this is the... Uh, oops, getting ahead of myself. And so here's Dayton right here. Here is Oakwood. Uh, this is the Kettering area here and then down uh, Alexandersville, former Alexandersville of West Carrollton. There were both steam and electric powered railways that ran to the south of town providing passenger service. Between these two, the electric railways were a little more popular. Uh, they generally followed existing roads. Here is one running alongside Dixie Highway, <laughs> believe it or not. And so this is up between Franklin and the Chautauqua area here. Uh, believe it or not, we're headed southbound on uh, Dixie Highway, and this is all overgrown now, so it's kind of hard to recognize where this is. The river is off to the side here a little bit. But they tended to follow existing roads. They ran frequently electric railways. They were free of the smoke and the dust that were associated with the steam uh, railroads. Here is a schedule for the Su Southern Ohio Traction Company. You see they ran relatively frequently, most hours during the working part of the day. No dust, no dirt, no cinders, advertised the uh, Cincinnati and Lake Erie Railroad, which we'll talk about. The electric railways required lighter grade rails. Here 
and less ballast, less infrastructure than the steam railroad lines, and less, less, less infrastructure required for them. But both of these were influential, influential in the development of the earliest suburban plats to the south of Dayton. For example, the old Pasadena plat in Kettering, which we'll talk about, was served not only by a steam railroad, but an electric railroad that ran down, down Wilmington Pike in Kettering. So this steam railroad kind of cross-cut the plat. Passenger rail transportation got its start back earlier in the 19th century by the development of these horse-drawn street railways. So here's an example of one of many of these that existed in Dayton. Uh, this is the Wayne Avenue horse car that ran up from downtown Dayton up the hill to what was then uh, known as the Insane Asylum, now 10 Wellington Place. This served up to 10 passengers. Horses would bring it up the hill. Service began about 1872 with this. And there was a number of these horse-drawn railways in Dayton. Uh, but they began converting to electrical power during the late 1880s with recent improvements in electric traction motors, motors that would, uh, physicists will tell you that attractive force is what's required to overcome friction. <coughs> so a traction motor does that. Along with the technology to connect these to electricity running in overhead wires. So the old horse-drawn railways were converted to the electric rail railways thanks in large part to the developments of this gentleman, Frank J. Sprague, considered to be the father of electric traction. So he was, his work was instrumental in this changeover. He also did some work on elevators, motors for elevators, so kind of similar thing. So here's some views of downtown Dayton right after that time frame. Here is uh, one of these electric rail cars running down Main Street. Some horse-drawn wagons here. This is back in the days when roads were pretty atrocious. And so this was a good way of getting from one place to another without kind of slopping through the mud. Some more shots of pre-war downtown Dayton. A couple electric rail cars here. Here's run one that ran out and uh, served the VA Center west of town, I believe. Another nice view looking southwestward at 3rd and Jefferson Street. Uh, note that this rail car not only was serving passengers, but also carrying freight. So they were kind of the UPS and FedEx of their day. And for modern reference, uh, this is that 3rd and Jefferson intersection. So we're looking to the southwest and the, the uh, old courthouse is up in here somewhere. Another nice shot of the intersection of 3rd and Main here. Here's the old courthouse downtown Dayton, and you see the electric rail cars have made this kind of diamond-shaped pattern running in the snow there at the intersection. Another shot of the uh, early shot of downtown Dayton, here's a Conover building, uh, third and main on the, what is that, the southeast corner. Uh, some work going for installation of some rails, got a bunch of bricks and rails going. Here's some guys walking past, they kind of look ominous, dressed in black there, looking up at the old courthouse. If we zoom in on this, get a little bit tighter view, uh, you can see the rail cars here and some work going on. Looks like they're putting some tracks in. <coughs> and yet a little tighter view, showing you some of the work going on there. Another shot of downtown Dayton, this is the old Algonquin Hotel along Ludlow Street, and you see some of the the tracks and the overhead wires there for modern reference. This is that same hotel and we're looking over in the direction of Sinclair Community College here. Here's a little tighter view. Looks like some ladies crossing the street trying to avoid some of the horse mass there in the road and of course the rails and the overhead wires for the electric rail cars. Here's a, another shot of that intersection. You see one of the rail cars serving the, the hotel there. Another shot looking northward along Main Street, and a couple of rail cars here, the old courthouse, 3rd and Main, over in this area. The resolution's pretty good on this, so we'll zoom in. This uh, 
the Oakwood Street Railway. This is serving Oakwood. Winters Bank, here off to the side. Familiar landmark in downtown Dayton. Private fair up on his pedestal here at, at Monument Street in Maine. Another similar view of downtown Dayton. And so there was a, an explosion around the, after the turn of the century in this uh, in the uh, in, in rail car service. Lots of overhead wires, lots of different companies providing this service, all independent, not under one umbrella like RTA is now. And so they're all all these independent companies kind of coming and going from Dayton. And so 20, 30 feet, whatever it was above the city, was just this spider's web of all these wires to serve these different uh, rail cars that came and went. This annoyed John H. Patterson, president of NCR, and he wanted, he wanted to, to do something about that. Another shot of 3rd Main. Uh, I just like going through some of these old photos, showing you the life at the time. Here's a Wilkie's newsstand at 3rd and Main, a rail car coming in from the west, and again, the old courthouse here. And one waiting for railroad, the railroad crossing. So here's a steam engine crossing Main Street. So this was back before the tracks were elevated. So the, uh, the steam engines, the, the locomotives would, would cross at street level, tie up traffic for a while. Here's another shot. Uh, electric rail cars, horse drawn wagons, a few automobiles, and uh, all waiting for the railroad to cross there. So getting out of the city a little bit, uh, that this time frame, the 1900s, 1900 time frame or so, was a pivotal time in the area to the south of Dayton. So another look at the city of Dayton, uh, Miami River here. Not a whole lot going on south of the city. Uh, Oakwood was this teeny little village here, and there was a couple other developments. The old Shaker town had uh, closed up, the Shaker uh, residents there. The people moved from there to Warren County about 1900, so just mostly scattered farms to the south of Dayton. Um, so during this time frame, farms dominated land and ownership and use to the south of the city. This is a view I like looking northward along Springboro Pike. And so if you think Cox Arboretum, you come out of Cox Arboretum, you start coming down the hill a little bit, going northward, this is what it looked like back about 1900. Uh, not a whole lot going on. Alexandersville, mm -hmm. Bellbrook Road here. Uh, the old Woody's Market for, for reference over kind of this way some more and some of these glacially derived landforms to the south of town. If you can't get oriented here, think the Meyer store there at Alex Bell in 741 is, is right up in this area mm -hmm. now. Here's another nice vintage view from about that time frame. Uh, again, local farms about 100 to 120 acres on average in Montgomery County, often some wooded land. Here's a nice view looking into the Lamb Road area. This is where the Dayton Hunt and Polo Club would later go in. And again, for modern reference, this is the Polo Club here. Uh, Lamb Road back in here someplace. And an assisted living facility right in here. So all that is built up back in the background there. This was a time of, of increasing agricultural prosperity. There were developments in farming technology and soil management about this time that really helped ramp up agricultural production. Uh, there was initiatives to share some of this new information through societies and fairs. So here's an ad for the Montgomery County Agricultural Fair at the fairgrounds here, a nice vintage look at the fairgrounds and that octagonal building back then. It had this uh, cupola, I believe you call it, on top. And modern view here of that building and the, uh, the Coliseum. <coughs> Selective breeding was developed. Uh, that led to wonderful increases in the production of livestock, dairy products, Staple crops that were raised in the area around that time, wheat, corn, oats, rye, potatoes, and tobacco. We have a pretty rich tobacco growing history in Ohio prior to about the World War I time frame. Um, 
Landsberg <coughs> here had a number of tobacco warehouses, farms, especially the Germantown area uh, in Centerville. Uh, so tobacco for filling and wrapping cigars was an important crop back in those days. <coughs> and downtown Dayton had a number of, of facilities for storing tobacco and wrapping, <coughs> wrapping cigars. Uh, this is the A.H. Nixon Leaf Tobacco House that stood where the Canal Street Tavern is there along the uh, uh, Miami and Erie Canal in downtown Dayton. So same building here. The landscape's changed quite a bit. Agricultural prosperity raised farm income, helped finance education, and increased literacy in rural areas, too. Uh, and the Dayton Daily News in the early part of the 20th century expanded their coverage of agricultural news and information. This helped uh, uh, connect people in the rural areas to the city also. It also required that this um, increase in agricultural production produce the need to transport goods from the rural areas into the city too. So this spurred some of the development of these electric railways. Rural free delivery of mail was instituted about 1896. Further reduced the isolation of the rural population, spurred more need for improved transportation between the, the city and the rural areas. So this, this helped lead to the development of some of these rail cars running out from the city into the surrounding area. Oakwood, of course, stands on high ground to the south of Dayton, a very attractive destination for some of the early settlers who had things like lived in Dayton, maybe had sort of summer homes and, and hobby farms out south of town. Uh, we are looking southward into Oakwood. This is the flat, what was then called the Flatiron Point area. So this is a modern day Five Points intersection where Main Street, uh, Oakwood Avenue, Thruston come together. We are looking into the area where the National Cash Register facility would later go. And so if you're familiar with that area, landmark is Flanagan's Pub. And we are looking southward from about where the Flanagan's Pub now stands. So this is Main Street over here, Brown Street over here, a feature called Rubicon Creek, cross-cutting it. In the uh, middle background here, the Patterson Homestead, right up in this area, and then the Patterson Elm kind of marked the, the uh, northern boundary of, of the Patterson property. Oakwood, a nice place in the 19th century. Here's a couple of shots. This is where the high school is now in Oakwood on Far Hills, if you're familiar with Oakwood. The Kramer Line and Pleasure Gardens was now, is now the site of the Dayton Country Club. So the Dayton Country Club people bought out that uh, back in the early part of the 20th century. Oak, the nucleus of Oakwood, kind of what we think of the, the earliest core uh, that was platted, platted in the early 1870s around what was then called Central Avenue, now Harmon Avenue. And so this is the oldest platted part of Oakwood. Uh, if you think Harmon School, the city building, if you're familiar with Oakwood, that's all up in this area. And so some very early homes standing there. That platting led to service by the horse-drawn Oakwood Street Railway, which began serving in 1871. Uh, so here's that horse-drawn street railway. It's coming north on Oakwood Avenue, approaching the Five Points intersection here. And here it is at its, at its shop, excuse me, um, with the horses and the, the rail car and the crew right here down at their their uh, uh, garage there on Brown Street. The Oakwood Street Railway converted to electric power in May of 1895. And so the horse drawn uh, went out. The, these red, kind of wine red colored rail cars came in and this ran up and down uh, Brown <coughs> Street, Oakwood Avenue. Uh, here's a lady getting off downtown. Route 5. I grew up riding bus number five from Kettering into Dayton. It's still Route 5 there along uh, Brown Street and Oakwood Avenue. Here's a shot of some tracks in front of, on Brown Street in front of that Patterson Elm, which stood up through the early 1920s uh, there on the National Cash Register property. 
I have a couple more shots of the Oakwood Street Railway there on Brown Street at National Cash Register. You may know John H. Patterson, uh, very interested in worker welfare. And he, 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 made, he tried to make work as comfortable for the ladies as he could, and one of the things he instituted was the policy of letting them leave ahead of the men so they wouldn't have to ride the rail cars with the men. So here's an electric rail car full of NCR women getting off 20, 30 minutes ahead of the, lady, of the, of the men. The Oakwood Street Railway looped at the Five Points intersection back in those days. Here's an end loop here, and so here's a rail car at that loop. People would come up from downtown Dayton. They would deboard there and sit around for a while, wait for passengers to come back on, and then it would loop around back in and head back toward downtown Dayton. The most conspicuous structure back in those days at the Five Points intersection was the lodge here at Far Hills. This was the entrance to John H. Patterson's Far Hills Estate there. So we're looking eastward along what's now East Houston. And you see the electric, uh, the, the infrastructure, the electric wires there for there in the loop in front of his, his gatehouse. Uh, this, story, this was built in the early 1900s and stood for a few decades. He had an early telephone in the room, in, the, in, this, in this gateway. He had a, a man, kind of a gatekeeper, living there, uh, but he had, a, he had to take out the telephone because his son Fred and his friends were making too many long distance calls. Uh, here's another nice shot of the gatehouse, and you see the, uh, the, uh, the rails right there. Service along this route uh, led Adam Schatz, who was a German immigrant, a successful brewer and businessman, to purchase property, this remote property way out in the, in the, in the uh, rural area along the Oakwood Street Railway. So the rail cars came up here. He envisioned plotting an, uh, uh, building an upscale plat on his land holdings here that bordered the, the railway. His idea was, well, uh, downtown Dayton, maybe not the nicest place to live at the time, maybe a good place to work and shop, uh, but why not give people an opportunity to kind of get out a little bit from the smoke and the soot, the dust and the noise of the city, stretch your elbows a little bit, live out in the country, and then commute back and forth from your house into downtown Dayton or to National Cash Register. So he envisioned a plan there. He passed away in 1902 before he could fulfill his vision. Uh, his monument marker is, is one of the more conspicuous ones there near the main entrance to Woodland Cemetery. But his son Adam Jr. carried forth his father's plans and in 1907 <coughs> developed the Adam Schantz's Estate Subdivision. So this area right in here along Irving Avenue, Brown Street, what was then called Brown Street, now Oakwood Avenue where the rail car ran. Uh, this, this was very successful. And so many of Oakwood's finest homes now stand in this plat. And in 1992, it was placed on the U.S. National Park Service, Service's National Register of, of Historic Places, the Oakwood Society, Oak Historical Society, Makes, got, makes available online a self-guided walking tour booklet that tells you about the architectural styles of some of these homes and who some of the people were living in them. It's a, a very nice neighborhood. Meanwhile, uh, south of there in 1912, Park Hill was platted uh, by this what was known as the Spate Wright Realty Company. This was the first plat in what we think of as being East Oakwood. Uh, this is Far Hills Avenue here, Patterson Road right here, of course, so we're going down in the Five Points area here, John H. Patterson's estate here, National Cash Register and what was then called St. Mary's College, later University of Dayton here. So a few streets planted here by Spate and Wright. Buy a lot at Park Hill in beautiful Oakwood. And by the way, right after the 1913 flood, this stands 275 feet higher than 3rd and Main Street, playing off people's flood fears a little bit. 
in their ads. Here's some more ads for Park Hill. Uh, five reasons why you should build your home at Park Hill in Oakwood Village. Uh, various reasons, including rail car service. And by the way, it stands 275 feet higher than uh, downtown Dayton. Schaefer Heights was platted nearby. That was the next plat in Oakwood, East Oakwood in 1915. Uh, opening of the city's most exclusive residential section, the Schaefer addition to Park Hill. Um, transportation from the Oakwood car line. By the way, it stands 275 feet higher than Main Street, 3rd and Main Street. <laughs> First addition to Park Hill, platted later that same year. This is Far Hills Avenue, Four Boulevard, right here. And if you look at this plat map, you see that the Oakwood Street Railway had um, uh, gotten rights to for a right of way there along the boulevard in uh, in Oakwood, the area where the boulevard is now. Here's a newspaper ad, first edition to Park Hill, another effort by the Spate and Wright Realty Company. Here's a salesman gesturing out the window to this to this couple. The lovely view there. And by the way, the addition is 275 feet higher than 3rd and Main Street. Four minute car service purportedly furnished by the Oakwood Street Railway, meaning that these rail cars supposedly read, uh, ran every four minutes, which is uh, pretty often. Here's a nice shot uh, from about 1917, uh, I think late in the summer, showing you some of the development there in Park Hill. Uh, beautiful craftsman style homes going up in there. Uh, this was this is just a section of a of a large panoramic photograph. Uh, just a, a clip of that taken. It's neat to see the workers. They're in their their top hats, their smocks, their white shirts and ties. These are highly skilled craftsmen who travel around uh, building building these homes. Maybe some of the uh, supervisors or real estate people here in the background. Horse-drawn card. Again, this was taken late in, I think, 1917. And then early in 1918, this beautiful home right there can be yours. And you know the drill. It stands 275 feet higher than Main Street. <laughs> this uh, development of Oakwood, East Oakwood, led the Oakwood Street Railway to expand from the Five Points intersection right here. So here's that car waiting at the loop again. We are looking northwestward downhill on Far Hills Avenue toward Five Points. And you see they're laying the tracks coming up the hill from there. So for modern day look, if you're driving down Far Hills Avenue toward Five Points, it, it looks like this, a similar view. The uh, railway expanded into Oakwood, uh, or continued into Oakwood. Here is a vintage view of Oakwood High School. Uh, the junior high, I think, had just been built, so this is maybe a little closer to 1930, but it shows you this little shift in the rails. So the rails came down in the street here on Far Hills Avenue, and then they, they shifted a little bit into the boulevard area. So if you're familiar with Far Hills Avenue in Oakwood, you know portions of it are boulevard. The, the rails ran up and down two ways, a two-way service there along uh, where the boulevard is now. Here's another early shot. This is the high school before the junior high was built. And a nice look along Far Hills Avenue. You see Oakwood is, East Oakwood is, is developing. Uh, interesting story here. This was still called the Dayton and Lebanon Pike. The through traffic would follow north and southbound along what's now the southbound lane of Far Hills Avenue. Mm -hmm. The rails ran up and down what's more or less the, the median area here. And then what was called Far Hills Avenue, what's now the northbound lane, was actually a little side lane to provide access to this growing neighborhood. So very little traffic on this street, most traffic on this side, most of the through traffic going in over here. A little bit like the, if you're familiar with the area across from Georgetown Apartments in Kettering. You have busy Far Hills Avenue, and then there's kind of a little lane 
off to the side to get into Laurel Land and Enid and some of those streets over there. Same idea here. Here is a view at Four Boulevard. Uh, the Spate Ride Realty Company had a little uh, place right here, a little waiting room where you could meet the real estate person when this was being developed. And then in later years, it turned into a waiting station for the street railway. So there's a, a nice view of the tracks. Here in the foreground, for modern reference, looks about like this if you're familiar with Far Hills Avenue. This is where the cops hang out and uh, monitor the traffic on Far Hills. A little bit south of there, this is Wiltshire Boulevard. This is a southward, uh, again, continuing uh, the, uh, the route that the railway uh, followed. It's a modern day look at Wiltshire Boulevard. The Oakwood Historical Society's homestead is right kind of behind our left, sh our right shoulder. Here, if you keep an eye on this house right here, we'll go back in time in our time machine to about the 1920s or 30s or so, and you see this rail car picking up this lady. It's about to, to pick up this lady. It's uh, going northbound on Far Hills Avenue by then. The cars were painted uh, more of a silver color uh, back earlier on. The darker colored ones, one of the darker colored ones, was involved in an accident with a fire truck. So they thought it would be a good idea to paint them a little brighter color. This is actually a screen grab from a short clip that hopefully we can get to run. Here we go. You'll see the, the young lady cross the street, a couple of cars, not many cars on the road, but one car will come up from the uh, upper left, turn in to go southbound on Far Hills, you'll see another car zip by, and then she'll go and wait as the, uh, as the rail car come, comes and picks her up. Uh, so the uh, the southernmost expand the southernmost as far south as the the rail service ran it, it kept the the loop that it would that it would turn around and kept getting progressively uh, extended to the south. The last one was at between Monterey and Hadley along uh, Far Hills Avenue. And so here's a picture of that loop. Here's a car, real car in the loop. Some automobiles, you see the overhead wires, and we're looking northward <laughs> along Far Hills Avenue and into the, oops, hair trigger here. You've got the, uh, the rails running up and down the middle of the street. Another look at one of these cars, Route 5, there on Far Hills at Monterey. Uh, again, the later cars were lighter colored. Here's a couple of shots at the bus barn, uh, where these were later moved. The uh, headquarters were moved there. This later became Ray Bryant and then Frank C. Chevrolet, the old car barn that was torn down a few years ago for student housing. The Oakwood Street Railway con continued rail service relatively late. Uh, most of the electric rail car service kind of went away earlier than this, but Oakwood maintained rail car service all the way up until 1936 until it converted this service to the trackless trolley buses. So they uh, left in all the electrical works and went to um, buses that ran on, on pneumatic tires. Some of those cars, were the rail cars, were repurposed, located out to what was then our own Forest Park, uh, which is now Possum Creek Metro Park. And so they stood out there for a while. Uh, they were used as concession stands for camping cabins, for various other, other purposes uh, for a number of years. And what's left of them still, is still out there, from what I understand, not much more than just kind of some, some rust. Um, not, not a whole lot to see, but they were repurposed for a while, as were many other rail cars. Uh, there was a two rail cars restaurant on South Dixie, um, 
in the area where the Walmart is. And people use these for various other things. Turning our attention to Beavertown, this is early area of Kettering here at the intersection of Dorothy Lane and Wilmington Avenue. By one accounts, Beavertown formed around a blacksmith shop way back in 1812. So this is not long after the very first settlers came to the area. The first people in Dayton came in 1795 or 6 or so, and so this was not long after that. Uh, Beavertown, much of the economy was driven by some stone quarries that were there. So here's a, a rare early look into one of those quarries here at the south end of Beavertown. Uh, this supplied what was known at the time as date marble for a variety of needs. So this rock was very important before concrete became widely available. It was quarried quite a bit here in Oakwood. This is the type of rock that went into the old courthouse down in 3rd and Main. Uh, nearby Beavertown, there's a railroad trestle there in Delco Park that's made of this kind of rock. And over uh, at Wilmington Avenue and Bigger Road, there in Kettering, a mile marker made out of this, alerting early travelers that Dayton is five miles to the north. So it's neat that this thing has survived for so long. I went over and took a picture, this picture of it, and the guy came running out of his house like, do you know what that is? Like, yeah. He's very proud to have it in his yard there. Here is a photo, a nice vintage photo of, of Beavertown. A little later on, this was uh, taken about 19. 30. And so this is Wilmington Pike, uh, Dorothy Lane right here. If you're familiar with that area, think McDonald's right, right here. Toss out a, a, a food reference. And, oh, okay, you know, the light bulb tends to go on. Uh, Beaver Town was, notice that these houses are out pretty close to the road. And so almost all of Beaver Town was pretty much obliterated when Wilmington Pike was widened back in the, in the early 1960s. So not much left of Beaver Town anymore except for the name here, but if you kind of squint your eyes, you may see that one of these structures is standing back from the road a little bit. Uh, and this still survives. Here's a, this, as far as I know, this is the only building there near the uh, intersection of of Dorothy and Wilmington that's, that's left of, of old Beavertown. Here's a front view of it. It's neat that this old building is still standing, but if you look at the front wall above the roof line, here and here, it looks like it's leaning a bubble or two out of plumb. So we'll see how much longer that building lasts. If you go south of there a little bit, you do run into some of the very early houses that have survived and you can tell that the uh, how old they are by the fact that they're made out of this cut stone they have the foundations there that undoubtedly came from some of the quarries right there in the beaver town area the outfit about 1900 called the dayton senior traction company established a route from dayton to xenia through the belmont area so here's the beaver town area we were talking about Kettering, and if we go north, this is Belmont here. So this ran, this line ran up uh, old Wayne Avenue, out through Belmont, and, and out to Xenia. Here's an early ad for the development of Belmont. Meet me at Belmont Heights tomorrow, come in the morning. Uh, Belmont Heights, by the way, 200, 200 feet above Dayton. Uh, Take the Dayton and Xenia rail car to Belmont, five cent fare, step across the street, and you are in the edition. So you can come out here to Belmont and choose your lot, taking the rail car from downtown Dayton. So again, transportation to and from downtown Dayton. So this is coming out Water Delete Avenue. Note also they have a rail car pictured, uh, oh, excuse me, this is the... Um, if you're not familiar, if you, to get yourself oriented, this is a similar view right here. So Immaculate Conception Church right here, Water of Elite here, uh, Smithville here. But note that there is also a rail car here on Smithville. So later in 1900, the Dayton Xenia extended a branch down Smithville Road uh, where it ran into Wilmington Pike right here near the, what was the Desi? 
uh, facility, if you're familiar with that, and then continued south from there, serving Beaver Town and points to the southward. So here is a rate or a, 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 a schedule for this southern branch uh, from Belmont out to Roslyn Station, which we'll talk about in a moment, out to County Line in the area where Rolandia is now, out to White's Corner at the intersection of Alex Bell. From there, it ran all the way out to Bellbrook, and from there to a loop all the way out to Spring Valley. So a pretty long, mm. a pretty long line. There's a couple pictures of rail cars from the Dayton Xenia. Uh, here's one on West Fifth, probably between Maine and Ludlow, probably in the kind of the pre-World War I years. So a nice look at this vintage car. They have the, the poles down, so it's just sitting there stationary. It's not collect, connected to the electricity, so they're just, just kind of hanging out there. And then another one, another date seat in your car. This one has the connecting pole up to the wires there, uh, somewhere on Waterloo Avenue, probably about that same time frame. This line, again, ran down Wilmington Avenue here, Wilmington Pike, uh, in the Kettering area. The power plant that's, that supplied the electricity for it stood up here at the intersection of Patterson and Grange Hall. So uh, power for that, it had its own power, uh, served this rail line. This was later the site of the Lambert's Barrel Factory. So what was the power plant? turned into this barrel factory, and they had a bunch of ugly chemicals stored there on site, drums and drums and drums of this stuff, and in 1968 or so, it caught fire. A truck was not properly grounded, didn't have its chain, and uh, a spark set off a fire, and this place burned in a, in a spectacular fire. It was all over the news. I remember this uh, when I was a kid, going out into the front yard. I grew up in Kettering and looking to the east and seeing this ominous plume of smoke uh, rising from this factory, this barrel factory fire, and they say that the barrels would shoot up in the air and they'd explode. If you go onto YouTube, there's some pretty spectacular footage and narrative of this. Anyway, uh, back before the, when they had the power plant there, the cable ran down uh, to the south of there on Grange Hall, picked up Little Sugar Creek Road, ran down to here, and then made a westward turn out to uh, Wilmington Pike. So if you've ever wondered where the name Feed Wire Road came from, there you have it. Uh, questions at this up to this point? Sir? Do you have any idea what the expense of one of those homes might have been? In, in Oakwood? And, yeah, any of those you've got. Uh, I don't, re I, I'm not sure at the time, no, it's just, uh, just obviously minimal compared to what they are now, maybe just a few thousand dollars, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you look at the old, uh, many Oakwood homes are um, uh, kit homes, you could buy them from Sears and other places and they deliver all the materials out. Those would typically be in the, in like the two, three thousand dollar range to buy the the plans and the materials, they would deliver them, and then you were responsible for actually buying the lot, which uh, probably was, was you know, comparably priced. Uh, so that should give you some idea. Sir? The uh, Dayton Genia line that you just showed us, what were the economics of that? What, uh, was there enough business uh, between Dayton and Zenia to afford it? How long did it last? Uh, None of these rail, electric rail ones were, were ever on very strong financial footage. And it did last, um, most of them kind of went away World War I years and into the age of the automobile, which we'll talk about. But there wasn't a whole lot of money to be made. Is, is, if hopefully that answers your question. So where did, where did the initial money come from to build this thing? Well, uh, they would sell bonds, and uh, there was a lot of, of kind of charlatan-type characters. Uh, but uh, they, and then of course they would collect the fees, and so they would stay solvent. But I think a lot of people lost their shirts because uh, again, there wasn't there. They, this was back before there was a whole lot of regulation and oversight on on some of this. Sir, 
you, you showed early on a, <clears throat> you know, a maze of wires overhead <laughs> that you could go. Yeah. Did that mean that each company that had a, a, a attraction service had their own power supply? Mm -hmm. From what I understand. What would keep them from stealing from another <laughs> nearby? Yeah, good question. I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I, it's possible that some of them had some kind of, I think there was a little bit of collaboration, but I think for the most part they had their own, their own thing. Yeah. So, yeah, sir. I, I think the lines all had to be at the same level and they, they had to share in the expenses of, because it couldn't uh, couldn't have been at different levels of wires. Okay. And they would have to have okay, there you go. Uh, uh, frogs and stuff like on a railroad uh -huh. up there. Uh, also, it, it had to be all direct current, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, 600 volts, I believe. Same as the, the modern buses. Yeah. And they they uh, picked up their the other side of the electric from the track. Mm -hmm. In many cases, yeah. Yes. Hmm. Sir. Uh, going back to Beaver Town, you're talking about a quarry. Yes. Do you know about where that is today? I mean, what area? Hey, there were several, and um, uh, uh, there was, uh, well, if you're familiar with where the car wash is, there, uh, there was one there, there was one along Rushland. Uh, near where the old Wagner Wood place was, uh, there was a few more over by where one uh, by where the uh, Skyline Chili is. Uh, if you're familiar, so there was a, there were several that kind of trended in a, a southwest to northeast direction, and, and later I can show you some aerial photos of some of that. But um, uh, they were they they kind of were played out by about the turn of the century, about the 1900. And then they were slowly filled in. Um, I think that um, some of them earlier than others, but I think there was a, num a number of them standing when Beaver Town was pretty much taken down. And I have a sneaking suspicion that you got a big hole in the ground here and a bunch of clutter here that you want to make go bye bye, that a lot of the, the quarries were filled in then. Miss? Was the canal stop functioning? It wasn't along Dixie Highway. Uh, much of it was. Uh huh. About well, the 1913 flood kind of put it into the canal. It it had wavered ever since railroad service became more popular for transporting people and, and goods. Uh, so it, it sort of died a slow death from the middle of the 19th century on. But it was the the flood that kind of put it into it. Question over here, sir. The, the power plants that are driving these are, were coal power. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not yes. sure. I, I would, sir. Guess. Yes. Okay. Yes. There you have it. And, and if they're DC, then you've got to have a bunch of them if you've got a big enough line. So. Yeah. There you yes. go. Thank you. Yes. Sir, tell, tell me about what you know about the old traction line that went up the Miami River. Uh, we'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this was kind of a good a good segue. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. A uh, in 1889, a steam railroad, the Dayton, Lebanon, and Cincinnati, was established to provide some passenger service, but mainly freight to the region. And the real impetus for getting that railroad going was to bring in stone from the Lewis and Talbot Stone Company. Uh, into downtown Dayton. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this stood out in Centerville, in the area where the Rod and Mule Fishing Club is right now. So here's a modern map. So this is downtown Centerville, right here. This is the big green water towers that you see around Centerville. Uh, Centerville High School, right here. So an enormous quarry here. If you're if you're not looking at a map or a picture like this, you may not know it was something like 76 acres of land near downtown Centerville is actually underwater. Uh, if you're still not oriented, a very important landmark is right up in this area, Bill's Donuts. <laughs> Another food reference for you. Uh, here's an aerial shot showing you the route of that steam railroad. So this is the area where the Meyer store in Kettering is, and it ran down and then past National Cash Register and into downtown Dayton. So this was back 
1930 ish, when much of Kettering was still open farmland, and you see East Oakwood is starting to fill out toward Dorothy Lane here, or excuse me, yeah, Dorothy Lane up in this area. So Far Hills Avenue here, uh, if you're familiar with that area, the, the newer fire station and the library is right up in here, Wellington Pike here. Uh, Pasadena was planted in 1912 along this State, Levin, and Cincinnati branch going into Dayton. So little neighborhood right here in the area where the Wagner Wood uh, Lumber Company later was. Here is an ad from, from State and Right. They promoted Pasadena in a number of <coughs> newspaper ads. Come on out to this beautiful tract away from the dust and the noise of the crowded city. Buy some chickens and watch your bank account swell. <laughs> You can plant fruit trees and grow your own vegetables. Dayton will consume all you can produce. And so uh, uh, this neighborhood, uh, nice, there's beautiful uh, craftsman style architecture in that neighborhood. Same year, the um, suburban realty company planted this neighborhood, Oakdale, no northwest of Stroop and Wilmington Pike. So right in here you see some some growth here, and uh, for modern reference, Wilmington Pike here, here's Stroop Road, the Meyer store over in here, some of the fast food, uh, the Wilmington branch of the library, which they just tore down for remodeling here. So we're talking about this neighborhood back in here. Uh, this stood north of the Y for the Dayton, Lebanon, and Cincinnati Railroad, and so there was this feature here I think it's interesting to look at some of the names of the streets, right, when that was planted. Somebody didn't do their homework when they were naming the streets because they named them things like Monterey and Beverly and Oakdale, Revere, some streets that were street names that were already taken. And so they had to change a lot of these soon on, which they did. Uh, one street name was a change for quite a while. Uh, up it took uh, until about the 1970s or so that nobody wanted to live on Welfare Avenue. <laughs> Here is a date went in Cincinnati steam engine approaching Oakdale about 1912. It's coming from the south here. Uh, the other route is going over here. So for modern reference, we're looking just south of, to the south of Stroop Road. And if you're at least as old as I am, you might remember the railroad used to cross right here uh, near the phone booth lounge, the Casano's restaurant commissary here, and the, the post office behind us here. Oakdale was also planted along the line of the state Xenia route. And so the, the DNX came south on Wilmington Pike and crossed the a, a steam line here at what was called Roslyn Station. So Roslyn Avenue still is there, and I'm not sure where the name Roslyn came from, but if you look at this old transportation map, you see it, it designated as Roslyn Station right there. And I'm told by Harvey Hilton, who is a local railroad historian, that this is a Dayton Xenia traction car there near Roslyn Station. I think up about where Smitty's Hobby Shop is, if you're familiar with that. You notice it's marked for, uh, I believe it's marked for Spring Valley here. And this is uh, labeled Dayton Xenia, and this must be a summer car because it's got the, the windows up. So these, these they often had winter cars and summer cars. Meanwhile, to the west, the Dayton Traction Company in 1895 established service from downtown Dayton to Calvary Cemetery. And then this route was extended to Miamisburg in 1896. And so this route came down south, uh, southward, north and south, along Main Street near National Cash Register. This photo was taken about 1913 when the uh, tent camp for flood refugees was there. Here's the steam railroad crossing in the old NCR auditorium under construction then. Here's another view of that crossing just to the south the National Cash Register Complex, uh, rail car here, obviously. This is where they're building those, those new stone buildings, if you're familiar with that area along Caldwell Avenue. This is an aerial from early 1960s, uh, much, much after the, the service was, was done, but I like it because it shows you the general route that the railroad 
spot uh, coming along, along uh, up to up to Calvary Cemetery. So here's National Cash Register. Here's the fairgrounds. Here's the old River Park area uh, in the entrance to Calvary Cemetery. Here, Neil's Heritage House, right there. <clears throat> So the rail car came down Main Street and diverged onto its own private right-of-way about Stone Mill Road here, came up towards the old Southern Hills neighborhood, uh, served Sugar Camp, the NCR training facility here. Here's a nice view looking northward from Sugar Camp. Uh, this is the canal down here, Miami and Erie Canal. You can just catch a glimpse of the rails right here, and back in the day, NCR had a gun club that did some shooting down in that area. So here is some guys shooting, and if we zoom in behind this, this young man keeping score, we see one of the, the rail cars there in the background. Here's another shot of looking into that area to the west. We are looking where, uh, toward where Calvary Cemetery is here. This is the old river park area. The rail line went through here. You see the poles supporting the wires. And if you squint your eyes, you may be able to see a couple of sets of tracks running through there. Sugar Camp up here. This is where the Point Oakwood development is going now. And Oakwood schools are putting in their athletic complex here. That line continued near uh, below Sugar Camp and came out this way toward the Southern Hills neighborhood. This is the NCR River Campus right here, or uh, excuse me, UD River Campus, former NCR headquarters, the uh, Carolyn Park area here. So if we go back in time and look through this corridor, we see the canal right here, and the railroad road right away came up right through here. Uh, this is an, another money pit. This was a plan to use a rail car to haul canal boats. Uh, some people lost big time on that because that didn't work out very well, but they at least got the tracks laid for that. Here's a little tighter view showing you the poles for the rail cars. Here, uh, the Jewish Cemetery up along Shantz Avenue here, and the tracks right up here coming into Southern so this served Calvary Cemetery in 1895. Uh, service to that area led Sylvester Carr, a Dayton lawyer and businessman, to plot the Carmont neighborhood. Uh, he was vice president of Davis Sewing Machine, president of Dayton Country Club. A couple of vintage shots of that here. And rail car service to that area was important. Uh, uh, for the development. And so here's a schedule of service to the Carmont neighborhood uh, running quite frequently. That was platted in this area here where Neil's Heritage House is, or uh, was, and if we go back in time along that same intersection, here's an early view of where Neil's would later, oops, where Neil's would later go in, and uh, Rail cars coming up here. Keep an eye on this row house right here. We'll see that again in just a moment. Again, this was extended out to Miamisburg and later beyond. There were uh, tracks coming southward, north and south, along what's now the northbound lane of South Dixie. So this is nice and smooth for the rail car service. And then over here, the two-way traffic followed what's more undulating uh, road surface there. Here's a look along South Dixie here, a vintage look, aerial photo from 1930-ish. Here's Dorothy Lane here, a community golf course over here. So here's the Carmont neighborhood. South of there, Berkeley Heights was platted in 1906, just after Carmont, again along the rail line, and that would be the neighborhood right back in here. So this is a early look at South Dixie and West Dorothy Lane. So another food reference, buckle up. Uh, the Golden Nugget Pancake House <laughs> standing right about here. Uh, the names Carmont and Berkeley uh, Heights were abandoned in the 1920s and the, the, the um, neighborhood became known as Southern Hills. And so here's a, here's a car. It also came up and served Hills and Dales Park. Uh, which is a different story. 
Uh, that line continued south, so here's a vintage look at Alexandersville by air. Uh, so the line came, the rail car came south along here. You just barely make out the poles for that right here. So think Woody's Market right up in this area. Uh, continued south into West Carrollton, just up the road from us here. So came down here, here's the paper mill. Of course, the river over here in West Carrollton. And continued into Miamisburg, which had the largest settlement, the uh, largest population of the early settlements outlying Dayton. Uh, lots of manufacturing and processing businesses in Miamisburg. There's the buggy factory, the paper mill, Miamisburg twine factory. Um, the growth of Miamisburg stemmed from all this transportation that was available. Uh, here, uh, including here's a, a northbound steam train at the Narrows uh, near Miamisburg. So this is uh, just north of where we are between uh, West Carrollton and Miamisburg. If we go down the hill and uh, look back uphill, sorry, here's uh, the Narrows here on the topographic map. The hill comes very close to the river, so it, it kind of bottlenecks transportation through here, that's this area right here. If we go down the hill and look back up the hill, this is a fairly well-known photo showing you the five modes of transportation that went to and from Miamisburg. So we have the, the uh, Miami River, the electric rail car line, Dixie Highway, the Miami and Erie Canal, and then the steam railroad up here. And sometimes you see people sort of Photoshop an airplane into this picture, so yeah, again, uh, looking at, in opposite directions. So we're up at the top of the hill, looking downward here. Well, the 1920s was the age of the automobile. Automobile ownership went up as prices went down. Cars became more affordable, and uh, this uh, led to a, a decline in ridership on the, the rail lines. Uh, increase in automobile traffic led to an increase in the development of paved roads, reduced need for railroad tracks. A lot of the, the, the tracks were taken out then. However, one outfit did survive uh, through the 1930s. The Cincinnati and Lake Erie Railroad bought up some of these smaller routes in and around Dayton and, and, and actually in the surrounding states. They were major carriers of passengers and freight for a while. Again, lots of freight service along that route. Uh, some of the other early routes to the south, including some of the ones that they picked up, uh, early line between Miamisburg and West Carol, or excuse me, Miamisburg and Germantown. Uh, here's a few shots of that line under development between Miamisburg and Germantown. Uh, here is a picture of an early car in Germantown. It frequently became necessary for the more muscular passengers to get out and push the car over the hump or walk the rest of the way into town. This always seemed to happen on the trip into Germantown. So not, not always a reliable service. Another, another nice shot, early shot, uh, serving the Mud Lake Distillery there in Germantown. Uh, and some more shots of, of cars there in Germantown. A Barney and Smith car made in Dayton, a major employer there before uh, National Cash Register uh, kind of eclipsed them. Another route, a brief one, ran between Lebanon and Franklin. Here's a fair schedule for that. And so here's some of the early car in, in Franklin, Lebanon and Franklin Traction Company, and an early view uh, down in Franklin, including service to the Chautauqua area, the, the, the place that was kind of a religious and, and recreational area north of Franklin. Here's the, the rail car here, and another view at the Chautauqua right there in the Miami River over here. Um, again, major carriers of passengers and freight. So if we trace that route out of Dayton, here's a vintage look of the route uh, coming uh, southbound near National Cash Register. Uh, another uh, look northbound, northbound view of a southbound car near the, the building 10, the big office building 
another view just south of there, and then it's about to diverge onto that private right-of-way coming up into the Southern Hills neighborhood. So here it is below Sugar Camp, and then coming into Southern Hills. I ask you to keep an eye on this row house right here. Uh, there were a few apartments, and then a little, a little uh, storefront at the corner. Here's an insurance map. Diagram, so you see resident, resident, resident. A little storefront here at 895 uh, West Shantz Avenue. Back in the early 1950s, a man ran this restaurant with his mother-in-law, had a little lunch counter in the back. They started experimenting with some of the types of food that they served at the lunch counter. Anybody know where I'm going with this? I'm close. Casanos. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is where it all started. Big wow. Cassano, grocer at 895 West Shots. And here he is with his mother-in-law making pizza. So this service uh, continued. The, the freight service eventually lost out to all the trucking that had come up at the time. Uh, but they did keep passenger service as a Dayton suburban railway between Dayton and the factories in Moraine. And so, uh, Moraine, of course, had lots of, uh, of uh, industry, and people would ride from Dayton into Moraine. So this passenger railway served, uh, continued until September 1941, and then that shut down. And that put an end to the railway transportation in the Dayton area. Here's an early look, uh, uh, 1960s, a little bit of the route still preserved right there. This is looking into, looking northbound on Dixie. This is the old Hillsendale Shopping Center. Dorothy Lane here, our pancake house, Gold Nugget here, the, the, the uh, Walmart store here, and the, the rail line came right through here. So uh, not much, I don't, I don't think any, any trace of it's left there, but a, a little, little bit of it there. Uh, Carolyn Park, the Dayton, Dayton history in Carolyn Park have greatly expanded their, uh, their transportation section, if you haven't had a chance to look at that. And it's my understanding they have people continuing to restore some of the, some of the early rail cars, and so be sure to keep an eye on that. Uh, lots of wonderful information there about local transportation his, history. Lots of information, www.datentrolleys.net and some of its affiliated sites. So there is a group of railroad historians that can tell you far more than I can that meet monthly down at the Patterson Homestead on Brown Street, and they have uh, wonderful presentations down there. So if you like this kind of stuff, these guys will pick their brain all night. They're, they're happy to chat with you. So uh, that's it for me for tonight. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs> Sir? So did these tend to run, what are the hours that they typically ran? Um, some of those fare schedules, some of those fare schedules showing them, were showing them running like six in the morning till till late in the evening and running maybe about every hour or sometimes every half hour through through the uh, busy parts of the day you know the the steam lines didn't run nearly as often as the electric railroads did so they weren't there just to ferry people to downtown jobs or or, or the factory you say yeah, they, they didn't run just from six to nine and then no, 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 no. They would run through it out the day because that was the way to get into downtown. I mean, you had to go there for shopping or go to the doctor. Uh, and so they were running all the time and then also carrying, uh, doing some freight too. So they, they, ran, they ran a lot, very regularly. Warren. They don't know if it's possible, but for this audience, <clears throat> the one slide you had probably had where you live in. It would probably show where Runnymede Playhouse was. Um, I have pictures of Runnymede Playhouse. I don't know if that was included in any of the images. I thought maybe it was in one of those aerials that, uh, um, that you had. Of course, it's way back in the beginning. Of the, you know, of, uh, uh, showed the school and all that. You know. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't think any of those those did. Okay. Uh, but yeah, of course. Running the Playhouse uh, predecessor 
to this facility. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, I, I, but I don't believe I have any, any here. Okay. It didn't really play into, of course, as you know, that came, up, that came a little later than, than what the rail cars would have served. Oh, yeah. Sir? Where, where did the workers come from that built all these rails? Was there one company or a couple companies that, that would build all this stuff, or did everybody kind of come up with their own stuff? And they um, I think they just, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not totally sure. I think they just kind of employed local laborers from, from what I picked up, but I, I don't know that they had kind of their own, their own forces. Were they different gauge to, the different lines had different gauges, different type of rails, and things like that? I believe they were standard. Yeah, I think they were standard. Sir? Yeah, the, when you're talking about the phone booth lounge there. And yeah. That's the same line that goes all the way down by Centerville Mill and goes south from there. Yeah. So that was, so where did it go going north? It went all the way to downtown Dayton. Yeah, I, I gave that kind of short shrift, but the uh, the original route um, ran uh, between Lebanon and uh, out where if you're familiar with the route where the root beer stand is on Woodman Avenue, there was a there was an early line. That ran there, and then later they established a west, the more west northwest branch, coming out of close to Beaver Town, uh, where the where the Y was, and that ran into downtown Dayton. It had a, a it, it came near where Union Station was, but it had its own station there on, on Washington Street, uh, close by. But that was important for serving National Cash Register, and was an important, very important link. Um, when the 19, it had just been finished when the 1913 flood occurred, and so it was an important link to get supplies and relief materials up from Cincinnati. It ran on high ground, whereas if you look at the old flood pictures, a lot of the other rail lines coming into the city were low-lying and were washed out by the flood. So it, it was fortunate that that was, that that was there. Warren, did you have another? Oh. On your uses of tra uh, traction cars, uh, I, you can add one. Yeah. My mother lived south of Lebanon, and her farm was about eh, a thousand feet off the road. But she rode a traction car into Lebanon High School. Oh wow! So they were school buses as well. <laughs> Good to know. Good. Probably for a nickel or so. I don't know. I wonder something like that. And they also had stands out there for milk cans, you know. Oh yeah. Uh huh. That's great. But are any of the old lines that went to distant places are they bicycle paths at this point? Or sure. Uh, certainly the the steam railroad that I mentioned, Dayton Lebanon. Uh, much of that's been converted to the what's called the Iron Horse Trail and, yeah, and the the Dayton Kettering Connector. A uh, wonderful. Um, um, they're, they're, they're wonderful because they're, they're gradual, you know, gradual slope, and you get a swath of uh, a nice corridor through the landscape that you don't see driving. And so they're, it's, it's, a, it's nice to have them converted, and that many of them have been preserved and converted. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.